Hey everybody, ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchaf with an update on the La Nina. We're just going to check in, see how it is progressing as we're now almost done with October and about to move into November. You can see from the sea surface temperature anomaly map that La Nina is very much present across the equatorial Pacific, but just how much and what do the models say? Here we go. We're going to dive into the data here. The Nino 3.4 index, which tells us whether we're in La Nina conditions or El Nino conditions. It's at negative 1.07 degrees Celsius, and that very much means we are in the La Nina pattern. And honestly, you can see that visually as well with all this colder water upwelling off the coast of South America and being pushed out across the uh, again, equatorial Pacific. Lots of blue colors. Uh, it, this is a very healthy uh, La Nina pattern at the moment. But the thing is, it's not necessarily expected to stay that way for all that much longer. So as we look at the chart here, we are really moving into very soon what's expected to be the peak of this La Nina event, only lasting maybe another month or so before we're going to start to see this transitioning to some warmer, more neutral conditions back towards a zero on the sea surface anomaly uh, chart there before as we move into next summer, looking at a return to a at least a weak El Nino Nino event. So this is going to be a relatively short lived La Nina. We've been transitioning into La Nina over the last month or two. We knew this was coming, but really we're almost to the peak already. Much of our winter is going to be spent in either a weak La Nina or a more neutral pattern. We will dive into more of this, but first of all, let's kind of check the vitals here of La Nina. Again, we looked at that sea surface uh, temperature anomaly map, and you see a lot of blue out across the central Pacific right along the equator. Obviously, that is a sign of La Nina. We know that. We kind of expect it to look like this, uh, but it's not a super strong La Nina. We still have some colder water upwelling off the coast here, but it's not a deep blue color. It's honestly a light blue, almost yellow. So it's almost really uh, a neutral type of situation here where we're not that much cooler or warmer right off the coast. Now again, we do see that there's some deeper blue out there, so it's not like we're about to move out of La Nina uh, over the next the course of the next few days or weeks, but certainly we've only got maybe another month or so of these conditions. We can check the winds, check the trade winds right across the equator. And that's where we are here. Uh, this is the coast of South America, and then you start working your way into Oceania on the other side of the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, that area. And we see, obviously, those cooler temperatures. We see that we've got some of those uh, easterly winds, right, that are pushing that water, that cooler water, out to the west, out across the open Pacific. But as we look at the wind anomalies here, they're starting to lighten up a little bit, not necessarily quite as strong as they have been. So that would tell us that maybe this pattern is about to reach its peak. Maybe this pattern is about to change or, or lighten up a little bit. Maybe we're not going to see quite as strong of a La Nina going forward. We are now looking at sea surface temperatures, right? This is the depth uh, of about 500 meters deep into the equatorial Pacific and very similar, right? Where we've got the coast of South America and then you start working your way out into Oceania as you go further uh, to the left side of the chart here. So what are we seeing? Well, we still see that we've got some cooler water up along the coast of South America, warmer water out over Oceania, but this doesn't necessarily tell us all that much. This is something we already knew. What we're looking at now is the anomalies, right? This is how much cooler or warmer. Uh, and, and this is important because this is how we determine what's coming with La Nina or in the case of if it's warmer than normal waters of El Nino. So what do we see? Well, again, this is at the sea surface here, right at zero meters deep and then 100 meters, 200 meters, 300, 400, 500 meters deep. What do we see? We know that the, the pattern here, the circulation goes like this. So the water right comes from the surface and then it drops down as it gets pushed out across the Pacific this way, right underwater. Your currents about 100, 200 meters deep are pushing the water up like this until it reaches the coast and then it upwells right off the coast of South America, and then you've got your sea surface temperature right here. And this is a pattern, right? So it starts to sink over Oceania, the current picks it up, starts to move it, and then it upwells right off the coast. So this is a circulation. Well, right off the coast, what do we have? One degree cooler than normal, right? Minus one Celsius. That would continue to fuel this La Nina for a little bit. But as we look further back into the current, well, here's that zero line, right? And then as we look into Oceania, what do we have? About 150 meters deep, 
two plus two degrees Celsius. What does that mean? This means we've got some warmer water starting to build and this will enter that circulation here over the course of the next several weeks to the next month or two. And by the time we get in towards December, uh, January, right into the kind of depths of winter, this is likely to take us out of uh, La Nina and put us back into a more neutral pattern, at least one that's slightly warmer than where we've been, right? Because this isn't like plus four, plus five C, right? We're not talking about uh, exceptionally warmer water that would kind of flip us into a more instant El Nino, but certainly it does look like La Nina, the fuel there starting to come to an end. We're not seeing that cooler water continuing in, in, in through that underwater current. So that tells us that again, we are about to reach the peak of La Nina for this kind of cycle before we're going to go back into neutral conditions and then likely El Nino for next summer. I also want to touch on though what this means for hurricanes. As of this uh, recording, Hurricane Melissa has just made landfall in Jamaica. It was a strong Category 5 storm, one of the strongest ever uh, recorded in the Atlantic Hurricane Basin. And La Nina does play a role in hurricane development, both in the eastern Pacific, but also out across the main development region of the Atlantic Basin. Why is that? Well, with La Nina, we see typically fewer hurricanes in the eastern Pacific Basin and more hurricanes, at least more favorable development uh, conditions out across the main development region of the Atlantic. The details, here we go. Weaker wind shear in that kind of MDR, right? That main development region in the Atlantic, weaker wind shear, weaker trade winds, uh, and less stable atmosphere. So the atmosphere is already uh, a little less stable. It's, it's more unsettled. It's easier for storms to get going. There's not a strong cap on the atmosphere out across the MDR, but also Hurricanes really need a lack of wind shear, which is how uh, wind shear means as the wind changes direction and speed with height, right? With thunderstorms, if you think back to maybe Meteorology 101, if you ever took that course, with thunderstorms, we want that wind shear because it helps to keep that storm going. It helps to bring in the inflow at the bottom and push out uh, that wind at the top, right? Because it, it helps to push that storm along, it helps to move that thunderstorm. We want a lot of wind shear if you get those big, severe days. That helps to fuel those supercell thunderstorms. But hurricanes are opposite. They, they uh, don't have the same dynamics as a thunderstorm. So they need a very, uh, very calm upper atmosphere so they can really get that nice uh, eye wall to form. If you start shearing off the tops of hurricanes, they fall apart very quickly because of the way that the thermodynamics work. Without going into too much detail, the way the thermodynamics work in a hurricane, you need that kind of uh, weaker wind aloft, which is what La Nina provides. So the opposite is true in the eastern Pacific. With La Nina, we have stronger wind shear. We have stronger trade winds blowing from east to west across the Pacific, and it gives us a more stable atmosphere overall. So we typically see fewer hurricanes in the eastern Pacific under La Nina conditions. So is La Nina contributing to Hurricane Melissa? Very likely. Right, it's it's the Melissa has been in the Caribbean. It's been able to kind of sustain itself and grow into this monster storm because we haven't had strong wind shear. We have not had strong trade winds. It's been uh, a less stable atmosphere out there. It formed very easily, rapidly intensified, and of course, uh, sea surface temperatures and the overall pattern have a lot to do with that as well. But it's interesting how all these things are connected uh, when we talk about the atmosphere. La Nina plays a role in hurricane season, but of course, it also plays role in our winter uh, precipitation patterns here on the West Coast and across much of the United States. So here's what a textbook uh, La Nina looks like. Typically wetter from about Sacramento up to the north across the Pacific Northwest, but a little drier than normal across the southern half of the Golden State. And then, of course, we can look at the rest of the U.S. drier across the southern U.S. in general, also warmer as well from Texas out through the mid-Atlantic up into the Midwest and through the southeast. But usually wetter up across parts of the Midwest, colder across the Canadian prairies and the upper Great Plains. 
it, it just changes our pattern because of the role of this polar jet here. Whereas in uh, El Nino, it's it's the opposite in general. But speaking of California, right? Wetter up north, drier down south. That's what we'd expect to see in La Nina, and the numbers back that up. So across all La Nina events, this is showing us the percent of normal precipitation in the Sacramento Valley. Again, not just for weak, moderate, or strong La Ninas, but all La Ninas. We typically see about 97% of normal precipitation in the Sacramento River Basin, right? In general, that's the Sacramento Valley. For the eastern slope of the northern Sierra, about 101%, 102% across the north coast, the Klamath Basin. Uh, so again, that, that tracks from that kind of textbook example that we just saw, where we're wetter across the northern part of the state. Let's go down south, though. 87% of normal precipitation for the central coast and just 80% of normal precipitation for the southern California coast. It gets drier out into the deserts, just 78% of normal precipitation in all La Nina events. We can break that down a little more where weaker La Ninas uh, are usually a little bit wetter, about 101% of average. Moderate La Ninas are the driest of all, and strong La Ninas, 96% of average. So there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of different ways you can break it down. But in general, we typically look for a slightly below normal season across the upper valley when we have La Nina events. Here's what the seasonal models are showing. These change a lot. These fluctuate. These are not as accurate as our like day to day weather models where we're forecasting out 48 hours, maybe 96 hours. So take these with a grain of salt. These do change. What is November showing us in terms of precipitation? Well, across much of the United States, honestly, it's showing dry, very dry across northern California, dry across much of the southern U.S., including the Gulf states. All right, let's move to December. What does December show us? Here's the map. Still showing dry conditions across California, but more seasonal, right? More seasonally wet across the southern Rockies, across the southern plains, and then wetter as we move into the Midwest. That is, for the most part, what that textbook La Nina looks like. Of course, we would expect to see a little bit more precipitation in the Pacific Northwest and parts of Northern California. That's not what this particular model shows. That's okay. This is seasonal. Doesn't mean it won't rain at all. Just means below average precipitation, according to this model. Here's January, still showing drier than normal conditions across Northern California, but a little more normal across Southern California and parts of the desert Southwest. February now finally shows some above normal precipitation uh, in California and much above normal precipitation precipitation for British Columbia and parts of the Pacific Northwest. This, again, take these with a grain of salt. These are seasonal models. This isn't something you can lock in and say, oh, it's absolutely going to look like this when we get uh, to December, to January, to February, whatnot. It just kind of maybe gives us an idea of what to expect. And again, in a La Nina year, we would expect to be drier than normal across most of California. So, these seasonal models don't necessarily uh, surprise us with that. It'd be more of a surprise if all of these seasonal models were suggesting a much above normal uh, winter, right? That's not what they show, obviously. But again, it's just it's just a way that we can kind of look out into the future, get an idea of what might be around the corner. But there's more than just La Nina, El Nino, that in so uh, oscillation. We also take a look at the Pacific North American pattern. This one is on a shorter time scale. This is over the course of a few days to maybe a couple of weeks. But this tells us whether it's in its positive or negative phase if high pressure is sitting right over the West Coast. Because if it is, that typically means we're in a drier and warmer pattern, especially during the winter months. So this is what the positive phase of the Pacific North American pattern looks like. Again, high pressure off the West Coast closes that storm door. But the opposite of that would be the negative PNA. That means high pressure is out over the Gulf of Alaska. It's not sitting over the West Coast. That allows for storms to either drop in from the Arctic. That'd be our colder storms, typically our snowier storms, or for atmospheric rivers to push in to California via the more southerly route. So the negative PNA is typically wetter and cooler. Here is a real world example of the Pacific North American pattern starting on October 28th. And yes, it is actually off the charts as we go in towards about Halloween and the start of November. High pressure expected to build in. Notice that highly positive PNA, more than plus four. In fact, some of the models saying plus five, plus six on the PNA. But by the time we get towards the first few days of November, 
high pressure starts to move out. We drop back actually towards neutral right around zero to maybe plus one, depending on whether you're looking at the uh, GFS model or European model. Uh, but both of them suggest a more quiet or more neutral pattern as we head through generally the first week and a half of November. So we're not seeing a big switch to a usually cooler and wetter pattern. In the short term, we certainly are seeing a move to a typically warmer and drier pattern. And as we look at the actual weather pattern, this is true. Look how through the end of October and the start of November, high pressure builds in and just kind of sits over the West Coast for a few days. It's going to bring much warmer than normal temperatures to Southern California, but fairly seasonal to just a little bit above normal across Northern California. But certainly the storm door is closed. No rainfall or snow is expected across California as we go through the final few days of October and into the first few days of November. But that high pressure does start to move out by the time we get towards about November 4, 5, 6, and it could potentially open the storm door, especially to some quick passing storms across the Pacific Northwest for the first uh, after the first maybe week in November, right? Not immediately, not as soon as we flip that calendar over. But this is an example of what the PNA shows us, where the PNA shows, right, it goes positive, it starts to build in, that means high pressure building in, and then it goes to a more neutral pattern as we head in towards, again, about November 5, 6. So that's kind of a rundown of where our seasonal patterns are at, what the seasonal models are telling us. Uh, nothing too short range, but I, again, there's a lot of factors that go into whether we see a wet winter or a dry winter. And this is just something that we kind of look ahead to, right? Uh, La Nina gives us an idea of maybe what to expect. At this point, we might think to see just maybe a little bit below normal uh, of a winter in terms of rain and snow. But that PNA plays a big role as well. If that storm door is going to stay open most of the winter, then we could get uh, a wetter than normal winter. If it's going to be closed, right, that PNA is positive. Uh, maybe we'll get fewer storms, but we just don't know. We're just going to have to get closer, uh, so be sure to stay tuned. You can do that by downloading the ABC 10 Plus streaming app. You can get it wherever you stream. It's free, it's live, it's local, and we're always on there. We've got a weather playlist where you can get extended weather forecasts. You can get weather explainers just like this one. We also have weather and climate specials, including our latest one, California's Power Struggle, where we examine the uh, power grid here in California and how it's improved from the last time we've had flex alerts. We go through the history of the power grid towards where we are today and then looking ahead at batteries and onboarding more and more renewables. Again, you can find that and more weather explainers on the ABC 10 Plus app under that weather playlist. Thanks for watching.